the harbor today. Since we couldn't have you on campus due to the pandemic, we're trying to bring the boat show to you. And today we're very fortunate to have uh, Eric Simula and Derek Rausch here to talk about Birch Park Canoe. So let's go and see what they're up to. Hey folks, I'm Derek. Eric. And I'm Eric. <laughs> Today we're going to try and cover um, a lot of things. So we're going to talk about the history of Birch Park Canoes, um, the cultural relevance. We're going to talk about the process of building them, the tools, the safety of the tools. Um, and then we're going to be talking about the use of these canoes also. So we're going to go back and forth um, for the next hour. Feel free to ask your questions as we're going. Um, so let's just get right to it. So we thought of a, a leading question, and that is we know that the Native Americans have designed and used these canoes for thousands of years. And even when the early French came, they adopted that technology throughout the fur trade for several hundred years. So how did they make these canoes? That's our topic for today. Intro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, so before we get too far into this, uh, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Derek Rausch. I was an intern here at North House in 2017, uh, a few years ago already. Um, that was, I guess, my first exposure to birch bark canoes. I am by no means an expert. I just am familiar at this point with um, some of the details and some of the techniques. So um, over the last, what, two seasons, two summers or so, I've been helping out with a couple of canoes with Eric and um, decided to jump in on this today and, and be part of the presentation and, and show you what at least what I know and what I can offer. Um, this is not what I do full time. I'm actually a, a stonemason and uh, you know I work with mortar and trowels most of the time. So you know this is just something that I you know wanted to share. So that's a little bit about me. I live down in Duluth. Feel free to contact me if you find my info. So my name is Eric Simula. I'm a Finnish American and I live in Finland, Minnesota on the North Shore. Uh, my background uh, is really a woodsman growing up and I always wanted to be a wilderness canoe guide. So starting at age 17 I moved to Ely, Minnesota and just had a love of the wilderness and canoes and also for the sled dogs in the winter and through guiding dog trips and canoe trips, I realized that there was a long history with the indigenous people developing the technology, the birch bark canoe and the toboggans and snowshoes. So that led me to pursue uh, different jobs and ultimately to apprentice with some master builders, both in snowshoe making and birch bark canoe building. And then I was fortunate to get hired on at the Grand Portage National Monument where I could do interpretation in history and birch bark canoe, tra uh, canoe building and also for the fur trade canoes. Um, after the park service, I transitioned and went back to school and studied more about indigenous technologies, uh, native culture, and my wife is Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, so I was able to have uh, community connections, family connections, and work with some some very skilled elders, uh, many of whom are no longer with us, and part of their concern is the disappearance of their language and some of these cultural skills. So only with some, some serious thought and consideration and asking permission or, I guess, whether it's appropriate for a white guy to be teaching Native skills, um, I think the conclusion is that because I strive to do it respectfully and I give credit where credit is due to the native builders for, for really retaining this history and passing it on. And regardless of your, your heritage, I think if you can do it respectfully and listen to the elders, um, then it's appropriate to, to share these skills. So again, I'm a Finnish American and I think my Finnish and Sami indigenous uh, history is where I, I gain my strength and foundation. And there's so many similarities to working birch bark and, and roots and the craft work. Uh, so that's kind of where my background has come from. And then I've worked at North Hall Folk School here as an instructor for the last 20 years. 
focusing primarily on the Birch Park new building. So with that, uh, we're going to transition into the history of the Birch Park canoe. And I will come over here and show you a few things about these canoes. And I'm going to start with some models. You can see different sizes here. But this is a model birch bark canoe that shows a couple of things. First of all, the white side of the birch bark goes on the inside of the canoe. The outside of the canoe is the smooth inside of the outer birch bark. And I should mention when birch bark is harvested, uh, it's only the outer layer used so that the inner cambium layer stays intact and the birch trees don't die. They will regrow their bark. Uh, this is a very typical uh, model that was used by the native Ojibwe Anishinaabe of this area and further east. This is sometimes called the old form. You can see it has a very high upturned end. This is known as the shear line where it's bent up. Uh, but this was uh, really the most prominent design used for hundreds of years between Lake Superior and east to the Atlantic Ocean in the Anishinaabe uh, region. Uh, once the Ojibwe came to western Lake Superior, they took on a secondary form, usually referred to as the Ojibwe long nose, or the western form. And you can see they prolonged the outer uh, circular end and didn't have it come up quite so high by comparison. So the Ojibwe long nose is usually the canoes that you see uh, in very old black and white photographs in the northern Wisconsin, uh, northern Minnesota region. And historians think that the evolution to a secondary model for the Ojibwe really resulted as an influence by the Dakota and the Cree canoes, who had a similar shape. Uh, it also, we'll talk about this more with the use of the canoes, but one advantage is uh, they were often with only four thwarts, now this is a thwart in here, but you can see there's no thwarts in this little one. And a primary use in this region is harvesting wild rice. And so the long nose canoe was partially designed specifically for the wild rice harvest. Okay, so some other considerations here. Uh, this one, most people like it because of the artwork. Uh, this is a very classic example of how traditional artwork is done. You see it on basketry quite a bit. Uh, you don't see too many birch bark canoes in the world today. But this is a very fine example of traditional uh, etching where you use the dark uh, bark, sometimes known as winter bark, but it's actually an outer rind of, rind of the cambium stuck onto it that can be softened in hot water. And then an outline of your image is etched in and it's a relief etch. So you actually do not scratch in the image. You, it's a relief and you scratch away the background. And this is a very nice example of it. Amic, the beaver. The birch bark canoe is also designed to be a functional vessel. And one of the primary concerns is that it's not tippy. So if you look at kind of the bottom shape there and the overall hull design, it had to be stable. Usually a wider canoe is more stable, but more important than the width is the, the shape of the bottom. The flatter it is, the more stable it's going to be. If it's big and round like a log, it's going to spin and be tippy. And I'll get into the process soon about how that comes about. But the basic design uh, has to be functional. It has to be safe to use. And they range in size roughly from about eight or nine feet for a small personal solo canoe up to the Great Lake canoes for the fur trade were up to four feet long. But the, the concept was very similar. Um, why don't we go down and start with the, the newest canoe to, and we'll walk through the sequence here. Uh, no, let me step back. I want to transition. Derek wants to cover the tools first, and then I'll cover the materials, and then continue the process. So take her Derek. All right. So one of the nice things about birch bark canoe construction is you really can do it with uh, a limited number of tools. Um, some would argue that it's better not to have so many tools in your quiver for this. Um, so I guess I'll just start from one end and work my way to the other. They're not necessarily used in that order, but that's just how it's laid out. So uh, here we've got a carving axe. Uh, this happens to be a Grand Spurs Brook. 
Um, I don't know, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of between two and a half, three pounds, something like that. Um, this one's a double bevel, but uh, yeah, really useful. Just takes a little bit of time to get the muscle memory down with them. Of course, you know, keep it sheathed if you're not using it. Um, wedges, useful for practically everything. Um, this one would be, you know, what we're gonna probably use to split if we have a cedar log and we need to, you know, get it started. Then we would move on to the fro. Um, I think you can, you can use them interchangeably as, as you, you know, see fit. On, you know, depending on how things are behaving for you. Um, so a little bit about the fro. The cutting edge is actually on the bottom. Works by striking it with a cudgel, mallet, or you know, just a heavy piece of hardwood. In this case so um, this is a pretty nice one and um, otherwise we got a couple draw knives here uh, this one is mine I've been using it for a while um, they're all a little bit different they all have a little bit different shapes um, I'll actually demonstrate how this works in a little bit so I probably won't go into the draw knife a ton right now um, probably the most commonly used tool uh, is a crooked knife uh, Eric could probably tell you a lot more about the history of the crooked knife than I could, um, but it works similarly to, and I'll get into the demonstration, he could probably tell you, tell you the history while I'm demonstrating, but that works um, in a drawing um, motion towards yourself, which seems counterintuitive, but in the demonstration it'll make a little bit more sense, there's a safe way to do it. Um, so we got that, back in the sheath, and then a common, just using knife. Uh, this is Eric's. I keep mine on my hip. Just a everyday Mora knife. Um, we got a couple of ribs. I think from Moose, moose, moose rib. Um, something I don't use as often. It's a good burnishing tool. Um, and then we have a couple of awls one antler and one steel. I definitely use the steel one more than the antler, but they both have their, their benefits. Um, scissors, you'll see why. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I mentioned the, you know, just a heavy cudgel. And then here, this is kind of your, your partner that goes with the cudgel. It's for setting ribs. And I can demonstrate that a little bit later. Um, these are actually for safety purposes. Uh, are actually to protect your leg especially if you're using a knife in a drawing motion it's helpful to put something down and I'll, I'll show how that all works out in a little bit um, Eric do you think there's anything else that you know this is pretty much the, the kit um, and caboodle <laughs> um, yeah what's next what do we want to talk about uh, let's go into the materials so I'm gonna take a couple of these and sure, just to demonstrate. So, over here. A birch bark canoe. You need some birch bark. So, here are two rolls of birch bark, and they're a few years old, but I'll mention a few things. First of all, this is a single sheet off of a big tree that not huge, but a good sized tree, maybe about this big around. This would be the circumference of the tree. But this is long enough to probably build a 16 foot canoe out of a single sheet. And that's what you want ideally on the bottom of the canoe so that there's no seams. Now sometimes you have cracks or blemishes and you have to splice and repair or cut as you build. But, and I'll show you, uh, we have at least one canoe here that is a single sheet, two actually. Um, and I'll, I'll show you up close. Um, ideally, you want thick, very high quality bottom bark because that's where the potential abrasion is as you're using the canoe. And initially, a lot of people may think that a birch bark canoe must be real fragile. And in some ways it is, but because there'll be a continuous floor of cedar clanking and ribbing that gets pounded in and stretches the birch bark, which is a process we'll explain because it's little known. Um, you're actually uh, providing such good quality support to the bar that you're more likely to break a rib on impact than to crack the bar. 
So uh, this is the bottom sheet of bark, one long roll. Uh, this is dried and it would be soaked uh, before you unroll it. You can heat it, either small pieces you can just hold over a fire to soften it. It will enhance the curling though. You try to minimize curling. You see on the edge, this would need to be trimmed off before it's used. Um, and ideally, uh, you want to use fresh bark off the tree when you build a canoe. But this is a nice roll bottom bark. Here's another roll, similar. Uh, this is a little thinner, so this could be used on the sides of the canoe. And typically, you would slice it roughly in half the whole length and put one half on each half of the canoe to, to gain enough uh, surface area to cover the sides of the canoe. I should also mention that if you look at the way these rolls are rolled up, you can see the lenticels. And these are the lines that go around the birch tree. And what that, that means is that there was a long slice taken on birch tree. It was peeled usually in late June or early July. That's when it peels the best. And that long sheet of bark, you know, which was curled around the tree, will often want to curl tops away in sunlight. And to minimize that curling and for ease of transport, you're actually rolling it up the tree, not the way it's around the tree. So that's why you see the lenticels. And for larger, longer sheets of bark, this is how you want to roll. They're uh, very stable and will last for many years and very usable. So that's the birch bark. I should also mention that ideally in the process of making a birch bark canoe, you want to harvest your bark and use it fresh, which means there's a lot of time to prepare all the wooden framing. Um, you can even do that in the winter. So this is a nice continuation of the building process. Uh, we just talked about a single sheet of bark. And Dick, yeah, can you help me pick this up from the edge just to show the bottom bark? And you can see this is also a single sheet of bottom bark that's been formed already through the shape of the bottom. This was done at the last North House class, the day after we harvested off the tree. You can also see a wooden framework to shape the bottom. And that's how you get the wide flat bottom initially. The bark is heated and hot with hot water on the edges to bend it up around. Traditionally, they were built outside on the grass. And then once that bark is bent up, you drive wooden stakes. This is a nice birch one. We use this when we build them on outside building beds and drive it, pound it into the ground to keep this bark from flopping back down. So once you bend it up with hot water, you can hold it in place with a stake. So there'll be about 15, 20 stakes all around this canoe to hold this bark in place. Now this was bent on a shop table right here in North House in class, and we used L braces clamped to the side to get the same effect. Now in the meantime, this bark has curled. This is not ideal, but this is what happens when you prolong the process and not have it supported. Now you can heat this back up and straighten it a little bit. You can see we posed it down this morning to get it wet. You can manipulate, but this is gonna to need to be trimmed off and the side bark will be a little bit lower than had this uh, been utilized initially. Uh, but this shows the process of shaping the bottom bark. That's the first major construction phase. This wooden template is not part of the canoe. This will be removed. Okay. The, uh, the next phase would be to sew on the side bark, and I have some over here, just to simply to get the process. This is a sheet of side bark then that would be extended to this bottom sheet, and this is where you need to sew it on. So we started a little stitch here of spruce root, just to show how the side bark is attached to the bottom bark. And this is an extremely important scene because later on, you'll be putting ribs in the hull and you actually pound them in under pressure and stretch this bark tight. And so there's a lot of tension when you move this way, but very little this way. Here's an overlap where the side bark from here to here is overlap. And when you build a canoe, you almost always want the overlap continuous. So you determine which is gonna be the bow, the front of the canoe. And so if this is the overlap, you would want this canoe traveling in this direction so that the water passes over 
kind of like shingles on a roof. You want to shed the water as you go through it. Okay, um, after this template is pulled out and the side bark is sewn in, then we would want to put the gunwales on. And we'll show you what cedar gunwales for this canoe would look like. And here's a nice set of rails made for this canoe. You can see there's four rails here. There's uh, little thicker ones and a little thinner ones. Uh, the, the thicker ones will go on the inside of the top edge of the bark, called the in whale, and then the out whale will be on the outside of the bark. That will be pegged with hardwood pegs and latch. And we'll go on to the next canoe that is in a further stage of completion that will show this more clearly. Finding good bottom bark is always a challenge for a canoe. And typically, you want a bigger tree, but it doesn't have to be huge. Um, you know, a tree like this, if it's got good, thick, quality bark and it's the length of the canoe, I would use. You know, if you can get a bigger tree like this, look how wide that is. That will come up from gunnel across the bottom of the canoe and back up. So my stand is almost six feet. And I don't know what the circumference is, but I, I think I've only found one tree for bottom bark this big. Most of these canoes, the tree has been made about like that. Uh, I would prefer quality bark over size any day. You want continuous quality through your, all your materials. And you combine that with good craftsmanship and you've got to do a bit of Good question. Very important. Uh, you can. Oh, I can. Well, um, you mentioned that the in the material talk, um, kind of the seasons of some of the harvest. Um, and I think you mentioned that bark would come off the tree easiest end of June, early July. Um, I know it also is in the winter and the coldest time of the season. Um, but there's a difference between how how that bark behaves after the fact, no? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the easiest time is when the sap is flowing. Again, June and July. July 4th, a week or two before or after, is almost always the best time to harvest, in my experience, at least in this region. And it can vary based on the climate and location. But the white birch in the boreal forest in this region uh, generally peels very easy during the July 4th uh, window. What happens after that, by early August, even end of July, it'll peel easy, but it'll come off and be laminated. So instead of being one uniform thickness, it'll sometimes have split into separate layers, and you try to avoid that. Up beyond that, in late season and most of the winter, it's very difficult to pry it off of the cambium. And what happens is the cambium will stick to the outer bark and often rip the outer bark off. So if you have to take bark off in the, in the off season, not only is it difficult physically prying it off, but you risk damaging it. So we try to avoid that for bark and the tree. Um, not so much the tree, but unless you're taking that candy right in the state. Yeah. So if at all possible, you try to harvest bark during the June, July, or early August season. Uh, the, the other concept is winter bark, and maybe that's what we're getting at, where sometimes before uh, the main harvest season or after, if it doesn't get animated, you can get bark that kind of sticks to the candium, and if you hit it just right, and you have a uniform layer that doesn't pull too much of the candium off, just that, that kind of dark red or orange rind, that is prized by basket makers for the artistic etching layer. And that was commonly used by uh, master crew builders to put their personal, personal marks or their totem design uh, in their canoes. Um, but a lot of the canoes, I would say the far majority, had no uh, artistic design. They were just utility, functional canoes. But the artistry of the individual builder, just the way he or she you know, processed the materials, 
uh, often with their signature in and of themselves. And I should mention that almost all the builders in a tribe follow the same tribal form, and the same curvature of the end, the same basic hull design. And that's unique because every tribe did it a little differently. It's ma mainly based on where they were living, the conditions, you know, with big water, with the red rapids, they have long pairs, etc. Uh, but you did have individual builders that did things slightly different, even within that same private form. So, anything else on bark? We should demo, huh? Yeah, let's... Uh... Let me finish this canoe, yeah. and then we'll go into the demonstration. Okay, so this is an 18-foot birch bark canoe, based on a design from the Poudre, Wisconsin, for harvesting wild rice. This is a 7-foot canoe, so it has one in the center, and then three additional on each end because of its size. Notice it's pretty wide too. And the Ojibwe had a technique for actually widening the canoe called flaring the gunnel, which uh, lifts up the bottom so it doesn't end up too deep and it gives it a, a little more rock on the bottom. And that was desirable, so it made it easier turning the rice down. Uh, this canoe was uh, started in 2009 when we harvested the bark and bent it at farm house fast. And for the last 10 years, it's been worked on for at least a week at North House Tech School for parcel. And it's still probably only about 75 to 80 percent done. But what this does show is, uh, continuing on from the last minute, this shows the, the in whale and out whale to support the birch bark. That is initially clamped together over the side bark. And then uh, under every other lash, we drill and peg in a hardwood ash peg so that they're stable this way for strengthening the gunnel. And then these spruce roots are lashing it this way to hold them together. This is a very strong design. In addition, uh, there'll be a gunwale cap put on top of here. Here they are right here. These are cedar. So there's one for each side. And this cap will also be pegged on with hardwood pegs, like the two finished canoes show. And that's a wear cap, and it also provides a lot of lateral strength. So this is one of the last parts of the canoe to go on. Uh, the other thing this demonstrates nicely is the cedar planking that's put in and the start of the ribbing process. And the group lashing was one of the more common ways of securing the gunnel, and it allows a space here so that the tip of the rib can seat up underneath that gunnel. And like this one shows, it's still at an angle. So the tips have been put in. You want to grab a mallet? We can demonstrate rib tapping. And then this rib will eventually be tapped in, and that's is what stretches the bark tall. And that's a very important process. Maybe down here. Yeah. Let's see it's right in here. This will show this. Each one of those. Tap those will demonstrate. So these are a little snug. We wet the canoe before transporting it, so it's Maybe a little bit more sticky. So we have a piece of softer wood. This is cedar here. Uh, acts as a buffer so that the hardwood striking, striking the rib um, won't damage it as it's being installed. Most of the time, the pin points are right along the edge, right in the corners here. So just slowly work back and forth. You notice as it's going in, it's, it's actually pushing against the actual the geometry of the boat here. So that's getting tighter. The rib itself is going to be stretching and, and getting more and more snug. Um, so also you want to work from the stern towards the middle or from the bow towards the middle because that stretching just continues its way outwards. Eric always likes to mention that you don't want to force this either. There's a lot of work that goes into every step of this, so you want to make sure that as you're taking the next step that you don't do anything to stress the previous steps too much. I had a question come in. So I was wondering if um, were they using hardwood pegs historically? Yeah, we hand carve all our pegs out of ash or birch. But usually we use ash. Um, these forts are made of ash. You can see the nice wood grain. Again, a thicker, strong hardwood is heavier and stronger. 
but you can see how you're balancing seven crossbars on top to the approximate strength of you know many many more ribs going across the box and likewise through the softwood cedar gunnels uh, you're pegging with hand carved hardwood pegs it's uh, very time consuming to carve but we may have close to 200 pegs in this group. And was that typical historically as well? Absolutely. You know, some modern builders have omitted the gunwale caps because this is functional. You can paddle this without the, the gunwale cap on it. And you'll see that sometimes. But historically, they were almost always capped with a gunwale cap. And I believe that's mostly for strength because you've got lateral strength here. Whereas these are thinner rails. And the gunwale cap not only strengthens it this way, but it also is a protective wear cap. So if you're going in and out of the canoe, loading, uh, putting the paddle up across the, the gunnels, then you're not abrading these cedar uh, spruce roots. So, good question. Uh, a lot of time goes into making pegs. Uh, we cross peg, uh, well, we peg vertically down through the inwale, through the hardwood uh, thwart, so that this, this uh, mortise, this tenon end of the thwart, where it goes into the hole or mortise of the gunwale, doesn't pull out. So it, it's, you can't see it now, but it's pegged down vertically. And then, like I said, we peg horizontally through the gunnel, all, all around it, just for strength. We're also pegging at the end. Uh, you can see a peg down here. This is the headboard supporting the stem that's already in and laced in, so you can't see it. But I can, I can show you this one. Here is a pair of stems for the next canoe showing the curvature. This is a single piece of cedar, quite long. It's been split many times very carefully so that when soaked in hot water, you can bend it without cracking. And that's how the builders would make their stem pieces to get the tribal form or curvature of the end. So this is a pair and you can see here that this would be inserted in the bark it's attached to a solid headboard here that you've seen. This will be trimmed off. And then we put a brace in here. This is a different curvature. But you can see how this is bent this way. Another piece is here. That goes through. And so if you look in here, you can see where that is cross pegged. And that's another application for a, for a hardwood peg. That's made of ash also. And this is nicely done. It's a, it, it's a lot of uh, detail to get all the specs right so that it's not too wide and bulging. It's not no soft spots. It's the right curvature. Uh, this is highly evolved and every tribe had their own style of doing it. Yes? Yeah. I think we should uh, bypass that and go right into the root lashing yeah. and trimming the bark because that's uh, a little more visual, mm -hmm. interesting, and we're on this canoe. And so, so to follow up, uh, we're in the process of making this canoe and we're getting to doing some of the technical end work. Derek is going to demonstrate some of this uh, spruce root lashing around the gunnel and then I'm going to uh, trim the bark. This one's already trimmed, and this alt whale, like a stem piece, has been split. Hot water allows you to bend it up, and it's temporarily lashed here. If we looked at one of the finished canoes over there, you can see how this is some of the most artistic uh, finishing of the canoe. In fact, why don't you, you show that way? Here you can see the fine end lacing. It really supports the end. You can see the end of the out rail is sheared up. Here's the gunwale caps on. This is lashed. Here we've got a little deck flap in here. This shows the headboard, the last of the end lacing. This is the lash that uh, Derek is going to demonstrate now on, on that bigger canoe. Here's a hardwood fort. Here you can see pegging. There's a question about pegging. You know, this. a lot of times we put two pegs here, you know, like here. Here's an example of two pegs. Uh, the more pegging, the more stable this is, and you're not going to catch it and rip it off. And we often have to reset these pegs. And in years, they'll rot out, and we pull them out because the cedar is long-lasting, but the ash will rot quickly. But you can pull them out and replace them, and we often do.
Here's one, for example, that needs to pound it in. So we'll just take a part of the mount and tap it in. Every part of the canoe should be smooth to the touch. So when you're using it, you're not going to rip your skin. And that's just the way they made it. Uh, why don't you come up here and catch uh, Derek with that root patch. All right, so here we have some spruce root. Um, generally, you want to lash with the thick end anchored, and you bring everything in with the thin end. Um, because a root, just like a tree branch, has a thick side and a thin side based on where the tree is. So with these lashings, um, most of the time, if I'm doing it, I'm just measuring with my fingers. So uh, the stations are generally between three and four fingers apart. Um, and so when we measured out the next station, the next place that I'll work on, went about three and a half fingers or so. Um, so I already took the awl and I made the marks. I might actually need to grab that in order to stretch back out. But, and in general, um, I just keep it around because I might have to, I might have to manipulate that hole a little bit more. So you want to go in from the outside and then catch it on the inside. Slowly work that whole thing through, uh, making sure that the root stays untwisted or in line as it goes in so that it lays nice and flat and each each all puncture can be threaded twice and sometimes three times if you have a really thin root and keep that under tension as you go that's one of the trickier things about learning how to do this is holding tension with one hand while you're threading with the other. Yeah. Water is your friend with this. So going back in, do the same puncture. Pulling from the tension that I had before. Carrying alongside the previous loop, not over it, that's important. Making sure that the in and outside, in whale and out whale are you know, nice in line. And you carry that through. Um, Maybe while you're working, Derek, I can. Yeah. help explain. So Derek's got excellent technique and one thing I can mention is these bark tabs here are folded over and lashed in because when you put the ribs in later there's an extreme amount of pressure being pushed up on the in whale here. So that's why these roots are so important to be strong roots and tight, uh, tightly laced. The other thing is unlike rawhide this spruce root will not shrink as it dries. So that's uh, a very important reason to have tension as a primary concern. You can see he's pretty forceful with these roots, and that's just what it takes. I only was doing one station, I probably didn't need as much root. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Uh -huh. So for the holes, for the pegs and for doing it through the bark, are you only using an awl? Did you drill all those holes? You can use a drill to use uh, to go through the hardwoods mm -hmm. or here. Uh, the earliest drills were simply a bowl drill, just like a, a napped uh, flint or jasper arrowhead, mm -hmm. only you, you, you nap them really narrow, and that's used as a drill bit with a bowl drill. Okay. But certainly we can use uh, a hand bracing bit or a modern electric drill. I think you get the gist of this, yeah. Okay. I'll just tidy this off. So another question that came up too is how these were paddled. Did the, the users, were they kneeling in the bottom of the canoe? Did they bring in seats like you would in a more modern canoe? Or do you have a sense of how they were typically used? Uh, sure. Uh, the native people usually almost never put seats in. And it was really the fur traders that started uh, lashing seats. If you can see the canoes, uh, do not have seats built in them, and that's because that's the historical way that they were making these canoes. Uh, 
Uh, so yes, you would kneel or sit uh, on the floor, which is more stable. You have a lower center of gravity. Uh, I often sit on a pack. That's what the boys do. They do. In fact, I think it's the bourgeois, the, the, the leaders that really like to, to sit rather than uh, have to kneel or sit on a pack. Um, the first day knees are much deeper too, so the seats are more easy in place. But you would simply uh, put leather through these gunwale holes and then suspend, kind of like a swing uh, seat uh, for the paddle. Uh, travel in these canoes, uh, you know, we talked about the delicacy of the pitch, which is important to seal the seams. Um, but as far as the bark itself, um, you try to avoid rocks. And if you scrape over a rock, you might get a scrape mark in the bark. But especially when it's in the water, the bark is very durable. Uh, but it's the pitch that will crack easy. Mm -hmm. So you try to avoid rocks. You always wet foot, meaning you walk into the water before you take the canoe off your shoulders and try to never allow it to hit the shore. Um, you can bring it up gently and let it rest on the shore, but you're always concerned about cracking the pitch. So that's one of the concerns. Uh, likewise, this bark canoe has emphasis, these lines, and that's a weak spot. So traditionally, we never put them on a hard top and strap them on. But today, we often trailer or you know transport uh, canoes to the uh, you know the wilderness, and you rope across uh, on a birch bark canoe. If you're doing that, always go diagonal. If you're cinching a rope or a, a webbing even uh, around the hull, uh, you're likely to crack the bark because that's the weak spot in the birch bark. So a diagonal lash. Um, as far as portaging and camping and canoe travel, it's a canoe. Use it. Then you'll learn the delicacies. Uh, the other thing about birch bark canoes that I really come to love is the smell of the cedar, the sound, the feel. It's all natural. And even the wildlife, they, they respond to the energy of this canoe. It's, it's pretty special.